So on the AP exam and all the release one, uh, exams that we have to work from, there's always a question, or um, it's actually a series of questions based on the layers of the atmosphere. And not only do you need to know their names, but you need to know them in order, and then you need to know what the function of each of them uh, happens to be, and then how it affects us and how we've affected them. So that sounds like a lot, and maybe it is a lot, but the first thing we want to do is to be able in your mind to get them in the correct order. So, you know, you have the exosphere, thermosphere, mesosphere, stratosphere, troposphere, and then the Earth in that order, but that's kind of hard to remember, right? So, what I'm going to show you, and I know this is kind of like weird, something that I just made up, right? Um, I was watching E.T., and I, uh, I kind of made up a little mnemonic for the layers of the atmosphere. So, we're going to watch this little clip, and then I'm going to go back to the circles that we drew in the warm-up and uh, kind of fill in some stuff. So, here you go. Enjoy your little cinema feature here. So I don't know if you've seen the rest of um, if you've seen the rest of the movie, but let me give you a brief synopsis. Spoiler alert. Um, what ends up happening is, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, E.T. does get to go home, but they have to kind of run away from the police, and then they ride the bicycle over the moon, yeah, and then, like, E.T. goes back home on his little spaceship, and everything's fine. Um, so, <laughs> what ends up happening, you know, no telling where he goes and where he lives, but I bet, like, he misses Elliot, because him and Elliot, they were pretty tight, right? Like, they, were, they gave each other, like, Reese's Pieces, and... He taught him how to talk, and I bet he misses him. So somewhere in outer space, you have E.T., the extraterrestrial, hanging out. And so I think, like I said, I think E.T. may, I think he may want to telephone the Earth. So let's kind of fill in a little bit. So E for E.T. E.T. may start. Telephoning and then Earth, or 
if you like, then you can remember the little boy's name, Elliot, right? So, E.T. may start telephoning her because he definitely, when he was on the earth, he wanted to call home. So, why would he want to call Elliot? So, anyway, let's kind of fill in what this little mnemonic is trying to get to. The outermost layer of the atmosphere, and it depends on your textbook, right? But our textbook doesn't even mention the exosphere, but on the AP exam, they definitely have that as the outermost layer. So, um, E stands for exosphere. And then the T here stands for thermosphere. And the thermos there, the therm, is referring to heat. And it is the hottest layer. We're going to get into more details here in a minute. Meso, the mesosphere. Meso means middle. And if you look at the five layers, it's the middle one. Uh, mesosphere. So each you may <coughs> start. And the S stands for stratosphere. And then telephoning, um, telephoning stands for the layer of atmosphere that we actually live in and has weather and uh, most of the gases is the troposphere. So ET may start telephoning Earth. E is for exosphere, T is for thermosphere, M is for mesosphere, S is for stratosphere, and this T is for the um, troposphere. Okay, so those are the words that are the layers. Um, what I'm going to do now is um, let you copy that down, uh, but I'm going to start a little clip from the movie Earth the Biography, and I have like this whole set, and it's really good. I enjoy it, but what the guy, um, the host of the show, um, he ends up going into um, South Africa, and he gets to go on a plane trip, and goes into... Um, goes above the troposphere, um, and you get to see um, some snippets of clips from Joe Kittinger's, like, free dive in the highest one ever. Now, like, two years ago, somebody from Red Bull uh, was sponsored by Red Bull, and they had the longest uh, single free fall, like, in history. But Joe Kittinger had the record until then. So, anyway, let's just look at that little clip, and... <laughs> What you're going to do while we're watching is just take down, uh, they don't talk about the exosphere much, but other layers, they kind of give uh, two or three pieces of information. So just write down two pieces of information about each of the layers. And, you know, you have a piece of paper and it'll rotate, so just take your paper <laughs> and rotate it and then fill in that circle. Do you see what I mean? Um, and then I'll go back and make sure you got all the main ideas. So let me find that. Did our movie disappear? I made my movie disappear. I found it. Okay, here you go. And we'll get that started for you. This is our planet, the Earth. It's unique in the solar system, perhaps even in the universe. My name is Ian Stewart, and I want to show you how our planet works. I'm exploring the atmosphere. The atmosphere creates our climate. It protects us against the cold hostility of space. And it provides <coughs> oxygen to fuel our bodies. Our atmosphere is full of contradictions. It's immensely powerful and yet it's incredibly sensitive. It's destructive. And at the same time, it protects us. It's essential for all life, and yet it was created by life. Without it, the planet would be utterly uninhabitable. something very special. A personal tour of the atmosphere. I'm going to take a ride on a jet. And not just any jet. This one is one of the fastest planes on the planet. More importantly, it flies high. 
This plane is an English electric lightning, a legend from the 1960s. <laughs> and South Africa is one of the few places where they're still flying. Oh, yeah. My pilot today is Dave Stock. You're going to feel like you're stuck on the front of a missile. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if I like that or not. Part of me likes it, <laughs> part of me terrifies it. Yeah. Look at that. Lost the great Cold War fighters. If the canopy does not open, Things like that, you really don't want to read, really. Oh, the helmet. Uh, it feels nice. Yeah, absolutely. We humans are perfectly adapted to survive at ground level, where the air has all the right conditions for life. It's the right temperature, the right pressure, and it's got the right mix of gases. Down here, there's plenty of oxygen about, but after about three kilometres, the air's so thin, if you didn't have this mask, you'd slip into unconsciousness. The back of the arm. usually more than six miles thick. The troposphere is a rich soup of oxygen-rich air. It's unstable, chaotic and unpredictable, but life depends upon it. And in just a couple of minutes, I'll be leaving it behind. So as far as what um, you're going to be expected to know about the troposphere, um, you need to know that this is where weather happens, this is where um, any kind of climate change, any kind of greenhouse gases, global warming, um, anything like that kind of question, those things are going to happen in the, in the troposphere. So these gases, the vast majority of gases in the atmosphere are in the troposphere, including greenhouse gases that warm the earth. And so they'll definitely try to use that to trick you, especially when we get into uh, the ozone layer, which is coming up here in a second. The ozone layer is not in the troposphere, um, but I'm just telling you for in a minute, okay? We're going to talk about that. <laughs> and now I'm 40,000 feet above the earth. Okay, here we go, supersonic. Okay, okay here we go. So I'm about to go supersonic. <laughs> We're approaching 45,000 feet, and we're about to cross an invisible boundary in the atmosphere. We're leaving behind the first layer, the troposphere, and entering the stratosphere. A very different place. Here, the air is stable and exceptionally dry, so there's virtually no weather. The stratosphere is home to the ozone layer, which reduces the amount of lethal solar radiation reaching the Earth. We've reached 50,000 feet. So that that is, um, that's going to be the key thing about the stratosphere. <coughs> it contains the ozone layer, and so what I remember is the stratosphere keeps us safe. Now, um, some huge misconception that most students have is that the hole in the ozone layer actually has something to do with climate change, and that's not true at all. The hole in the ozone layer lets in more ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet radiation causes, like a tannin bed, not causes sunburn, skin cancer, actually causes melanoma, um, right? It can cause um, cataracts. It can uh, 
cause decreased primary production. It can lower the amount of photosynthesis plants do because it damages them. Yes, ma'am. What's the ozone? The ozone, um, so we're gonna, we're, we're definitely gonna get into exactly what that is and how it's destroyed. But the ozone layer is basically, ozone is a particle, has three oxygens in it, and what it does is it takes ultraviolet radiation from the sun and it absorbs it and keeps it from um, hitting the Earth's surface. It's basically like sunscreen for the Earth. So um, you put sunscreen on your skin and it blocks ultraviolet radiation. You don't get a sunburn. Um, so the ozone layer in the stratosphere, remember stratosphere keeps us safe, is like our sunblock. Um, and so we have a hole in it. And we're going to talk about why that is. Like this is just a kind of introduction. Nicole, did you have another question? Yeah, um, so could you, would you be able to tell that since you said like it doesn't, it doesn't affect like the weather, but when you can't tell that there's more UV. Um, so definitely people in the southern hemisphere, um, there's a higher incidence rate of, um, of skin cancer, like in Australia. Um, if you think about most of the land on Earth, um, it turns out, by the way, that the whole ozone layer um, is over Antarctica, and it kind of moves around down there, but that's where it is. And so the southern hemisphere is uh, more susceptible to the increased ultraviolet radiation. So that's, it doesn't really have anything to do with uh, no. So when we talk about how the earth is actually heated, the earth is heated from the ground up, and that's a whole lesson in and of itself. But I can assure you, I promise across my heart, that the hole in the ozone layer has nothing to do with climate change. And so if that's, for whatever reason, people think that, I don't know, um, from fourth grade or whatever, and I actually took like a scientific literacy, like little, cute little quiz like I saw on Facebook, and it was like, the hole in the ozone layer causes climate change, and I bet a bunch of people said yes, and that's completely, utterly wrong, okay? Like, we've talked about climate change, and I've talked about CO2 emissions, and I've talked about greenhouse gases, and I've talked about burning fossil fuels. Have I ever once mentioned the hole in the ozone layer? No. So, stratosphere is the ozone layer, basically. Um, so, the stratosphere the has the ozone layer, kind of like New York State has New York City in it, but the whole ozone layer is not I mean, the whole stratosphere is not just the ozone layer, but it there is uh, a, an area of increased ozone density in the stratosphere. But there's but more. That's just like the gas that's composition. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so if you look at the whole atmosphere of the Earth, like most of the ozone in the atmosphere is in the stratosphere. Y'all good? Continue. <laughs> Nearly 80% of the mass of gases that make up the atmosphere are below me. Absolutely nothing above me. Black sky. Black sky, well, dark blue. Yep. This is the height I've ever been. But almost 50 years ago, one man went much, much higher than me. And he experienced the atmosphere in a completely different way. August 16th, 1960, long before man had set foot on the moon, military pilot Joe Kittinger took a solo journey to explore the heavens. Not in a rocket, but in a giant helium balloon to determine the risks of high altitude bailouts from air or spacecraft. The balloon took Kittinger over 19 miles into the stratosphere. That's twice the height that I reached. <coughs> then Kittinger did something astonishing. He jumped. Oh. This is the actual moment. He fell to earth, reaching a speed of almost 620 miles an hour and yet he had no sense of speed. I had no ripple of the, of the fabric, uh, my pressure suit, and I, 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 it was a very weird sensation. I had no, uh, no visual reference of anything, so I thought I was really suspended in space. So if you kind of look at what he's able to see, um, the sky, right, one of the skies blue, right, the nitrogen, the oxygen in the air, absorb and uh, reflect, refract light, and that's why the sky is blue. Well, if 80% of the atmosphere is below him, there's not many atmospheric gases to, to do that, so you don't see that color. There's nothing to uh, emit that color to your eye. Also, he says that he didn't feel his suit ripple. 
wind, when we feel wind, we actually are feeling air particles uh, moving against us. And so if there's almost an absence of air particles where he is, he wouldn't feel any ripple of a suit. There would be no particles to make it move. And so he felt like he was suspended because most of the atmospheric gases are below him. Um, so the vast majority of atmospheric gases are actually in the troposphere. Um, so the, I mean, the stratosphere does have some, but not as much. And then once you get above that, there's not. Yes, sir? Um, so here he would be able because there's less air resistance, right? So his um, his speed would be higher because he has something. Well, not really taking a toll out on him either. Well, he has an oxygen. No, I mean, but like when you're at 600 miles an hour, like. Uh, yeah, so he couldn't he couldn't feel he didn't feel it. he didn't have anything to to reference to make him feel like he was falling he didn't feel like he was falling he thought he was just floating around which would be completely terrifying he was the first person to ever do this and they didn't know what was going to happen so what if he got stuck up there what? I mean that whole gravity thing though right uh, <laughs> that's where you hope that um, that Newton was right and you're like okay come on gravity. Kettinger had fallen at great speed as he plunged towards a troposphere, thick with clouds floating over a New Mexico desert. Finally, he opened his parachute. His jump remains the longest freefall in history. Just 15 minutes after he jumped, Kettinger was back on the ground. Falling from the upper reaches of the stratosphere, Kettinger had plummeted through 99% of the atmosphere's mass. 15 minutes before I've been in the edge of space, and now to me out in the Garden of Eden. We really don't appreciate what a beautiful planet we have. Although Kittinger had jumped from high in the stratosphere, he still didn't reach the farthest edge of our atmosphere. Above the stratosphere are more protective layers, so wispy and tenuous that they barely exist, but are vital for our planet. About 30 miles beyond the stratosphere lies the third layer, the mesosphere. It's this layer that helps protect us from meteors. When we see a shooting star, it's actually a meteor burning up high in the atmosphere. So those are not actually stars going across the sky. But <laughs> that's not a thing. Um, but that's a rock falling from outer space um, into our uh, atmosphere. And then the, me the meteors, right? Meteors, mesosphere, that starts, starts with an M. And middle, mesosphere is the middle layer. Um, but that's where that happens. Um. The mesosphere is also home to a strange phenomenon called noctilucent clouds. They're thin, wispy clouds that can only be seen in the summer at high latitudes. Beginning at nearly 50 miles high, there's the fourth layer, the thermosphere. Here, the atmosphere is so thin that beyond 50 miles, we approach the beginnings of space. The space shuttle orbits the Earth in the thermosphere. It's also where nitrogen and oxygen interact with the sun's lethal solar wind, creating the aurora around the Earth's poles. There's another way of looking at the atmosphere. If you could unwrap the atmosphere from the surface of the Earth and put it all into a ball, this is what it would look like. Its weight is equal to a layer of water 34 feet deep covering the Earth.
So a lot of times we sort of will forget that the atmosphere um, is made out of gases, and gases are matter. They have mass. They take up space. And so the average atmospheric pressure that uh, is on every square inch of your body is 14 pounds. So atmospheric pressure is 14 pounds per square inch. So each little square inch of your body is experiencing 14 pounds of pressure from the atmosphere. Your body also exerts a force outward. That's why you don't collapse. But like that whole walking thing and overcoming, um, gravity and then also atmospheric pressure. That's why life really started in water and then over time our little fish friends started coming out like we had talked about, right? Um, so anyway, um, that's just something to kind of connect back to. Um, what I want to do is um, go into the um, little drawing that I had made and make sure you got all this. So let's go into the little circles. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of make sure you got the main ideas. Um, you probably have more room on your paper than I do. Um, but like I said, the exosphere, that may not even be, um, it's not in our textbook. It may not even be, like if you go to college and study this, they may talk about it, they may not. But I definitely have seen it twice um, mentioned on an AP exam. So this is basically just the outer, this is the outer bounds of our, of our atmosphere. So beyond this, you're not in the Earth's atmosphere anymore. Um, looking at the thermosphere, the thermosphere is the hottest layer. So if you were to look at a graph, which we're going to do later, uh, we're looking at a graph of temperature. Um, this is going to be where you're going to find the highest temperatures. So these are the hottest temperatures. And then this is also where the aurora, which is the northern lights and the southern lights, um, that phenomenon that you see at the poles, that's where those happen. So hottest temps and the auroras. Aurora boy. Yeah, and then right. So you got oh I'm having like a blank here. Oh it's an A. It's an R. A U R O R. I don't know what else. I don't know. Last period, I was like, oh, let me just spell this. Whatever. So that's what happens in the thermosphere. The mesosphere, like I said, is the middle layer. It's where meteors burn up. That's really the biggest thing there. Um, and then the, the stratosphere and the troposphere, those are the, those are the two, like, that they're going to ask you most of the questions about. And that's just because these are the ones that affect us most environmentally as far as air pollutants <coughs> that we've created and their consequences. So the stratosphere, um, like I had told you guys, that S in stratosphere, the stratosphere keeps us safe um, from UV radiation. And the reason that the stratosphere can do that is because it contains the ozone layer. And like I said, we're going to go into these different phenomenon individually through this unit. This is like an introductory day for us. Um, the ozone layer, right? What it does, like I said, ultraviolet radiation, it doesn't cause, <laughs> it doesn't, it's not what's causing climate change. This is more like increased incident rates of skin cancer, um, cataracts, primary productivity, that, not temperatures. Right, Sarah? Got it. Um, so anyway, the troposphere, this is the one that we live in next to the Earth. This is where climate change is occurring. I'm going to go ahead and throw out a very common um, abbreviation, greenhouse gases. This is where our greenhouse gases are, GHGs. Um, so that would include water vapor, which is the most abundant greenhouse gas. Everybody thinks it's carbon dioxide because I talk about that one a lot. But the most important and most abundant greenhouse gas for sure is water vapor. But anyway, just green, like just the a greenhouse gas is just a gas that um, holds heat in the, at, the, um, at the earth's surface. So I have a whole another le lecture on that too. We're going to get into that. But greenhouse gases, just like a greenhouse, they're going to be the, the gases that keep our earth. And they're a good thing. We need greenhouse gases. It would be much more, um, much less comfortable without them. So this is where greenhouse gases are. This is where weather occurs. And this is where we live in the troposphere. And so this is, like I said, this is an introduction. Before I can go in and start talking about each of these things, we kind of needed to see where it was happening in the atmosphere. So this is just kind of day one stuff, okay? Um, anybody got any questions over this before I move on? Alrighty.